Today, uh, I uh, am excited to bring a message today that, um, that I feel is uh, just kind of a timely word. We're not in a series right now. Um, I'm planning out a series that we're going to do pretty soon, but right now, I just want to just share just some messages that I feel like God's put on my heart for where we are as a church. And uh, the more I talk to so many of you, it seems like um, you're just going through a lot. How I many would just say these past, just within this last six months, just this six months uh, of this year, it's just been a lot. There's just been a lot that's been going on in your life and all around you. Um, and so today I want to I wanna preach a message that I'm entitling Anchors in the Storm. Anchors in the Storm. We're going to read from the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 27. Um, you should have got some notes when you walked in as well that look a little bit like this. Would love for you to so to take some notes alongside with us, and uh, we're going to go to Acts chapter 27. We're going to start in verse 13 through 15. That's where we're going to begin today. And we're going to talk about what does it look like to have anchors in the storm. And so Acts 27, verse 13 through 15, we'll read it all together. I want you all, all to read it with me. We're going to read it all out loud together. It says this, when a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. Verse 14 says this, but the weather changed abruptly and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeastern burst across the island and blew us out to sea. Last verse, the sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. Father, we love you, and God, we just thank you for your word today. Thank you for your church, uh, every person that is here, every person that's watching online right now. Um, Lord, they, they want to hear from you. And so, God, I just pray that you would speak through me, um, help me to get out of the way so whatever you want to say would be said. And, uh, Lord, would you just minister to your people today, God. Lord, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive all that you have for us in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. How many of you have ever heard this quote before? When people talk about storms, they say this, you're either coming out of a storm, you're either in a storm, or you're either going into the storm. How many of you have ever heard that before? Ever, ever heard that before? You're either coming out of one, you're in the middle of one, or you're going into one. If there's anybody that knows anything about storms, I think we all could say we know a little bit about storms. I don't know if you knew this or not. In 2020, uh, we broke all of the records when it came to storms. There were 20, the hurricane season for 2020 was the record-breaking year amongst all years that we've ever had. 30 storms in 2020, 30 of them. We had 30 in 2020. It was named the highest number in history. 12 of those made landfall in the US, which was also a record-breaking year. But isn't it funny though that we have put names to storms? Like we actually give the storms actual names. I don't know if y'all realize that they didn't used to do that, but before when there was just hurricanes, it was just, uh, they would name it by like locations and different things. But in 1954, they started giving the storms names. And so we have, you know, Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Sally and Hurricane Katrina and Rita and all of these names. Imagine they give these storms. Imagine if you had any other kind of thing going on in your life and you just decided to give it names. Like all, imagine anything that bad in your life, you just started naming it and you gave people's name to it, you know, like bankrupt Bob, you know, that's, that's, that's who I am. Huh? Wouldn't that sickness Sally? You know, you just start, every storm that you go through in life, you started putting people's names to it. Some of y'all are like, there are people that I want to give names to. They're called child one, child two, child three. But it wasn't until 1954 that some meteorologists, and I don't know how this happened, I did a bunch of research and you couldn't really tell exactly why it came out, but some, at some point in 1954, a meteorologist decided he would start giving names, people's names, to the storms. Can you imagine the first storm that happened when he came home and he said, hey, babe, I just wanted you to know, I named something after you. <laughs> Listen, it's a category five storm. It's, it's gonna come, it's gonna take out a lot of lives and cause a lot of damage, and I thought about you. <laughs> so, Hurricane Amy it is. I mean, like, oh, I'm so honored. Thank you so much. And for 25 years, watch this, for 25 years, hurricanes were only given women's names. 
Did you know that? For 25 years, from 1954 to 1979, hurricanes were only named by women. Now, I don't know why that's the case. And I'm not going to assume that I know why that's the case. Because I still have to preach up here. But in 1979, hurricanes became equal opportunity offenders. (laughs) And men's names were given to hurricanes. All right? So you got a Harvey now, okay? You get, we've got men's names finally that got entered into the storms in 1979. And today we're going to look at storms. We're going to look at one particular storm. We're going to look at the last voyage that the Apostle Paul went on and, of course, had a storm. And Luke, who is writing the book of Acts, we know Luke wrote Luke, and now he's doing a sequel, and he's with uh, the Apostle Paul. And so Luke's in the, in the ship. We know there's over 250-plus passengers that are on this boat, uh, including the Apostle Paul, including Luke, including other prisoners. And uh, Paul always wanted to go to Rome. That was always his heart, to always go to Rome. He had a call from God that he was going to go to Rome. He knew that God was calling him to go to Rome, but he thought he was going to go to Rome as a clergyman, did not realize he was actually going to go to Rome as a captive. And so for two years, he's been in prison awaiting this moment to get to Rome. He's finally going to get to Rome. So his moment is finally coming. He's like, I'm so excited. I'm finally going to get to go and do what God has called me to do because he knew once he got to Rome and he preached in Rome and people heard the gospel in Rome, Rome was like the New York City of that that time. I mean, everything came out of Rome. And so he was so excited about this moment that God was going to use him to reach not only Rome, but to reach so much of the world. And so here he is. He gets on a boat. And just by the way, I just want you to know this was no Mediterranean cruise. This was no Disney ocean liner. This was an Egyptian ship that was hauling grain from Egypt to Rome. And so it was not suited for passengers, and yet there's passengers on it. And so we're going to see uh, in this Uh, a little bit of what happens as this typhoon-strength northeasterner comes in and begins to uh, give them major, major problems. And so we're going to talk a little bit about storms. And uh, if you take a notes, we're going to write a couple things down. So if you take a notes, I want you to write this first thing down when we talk about storms. And the first thought is this, is that storms are inevitable. Storms are inevitable. Now, All of us here live in Louisiana, most of us here, unless you're visiting from out of state somewhere, but I know oftentimes all of my people that are friends of mine or family of mine that don't live in Louisiana always ask, why do you stay in Louisiana? Why do you live in Louisiana? Because you know that if you live in Louisiana, it's not a matter of if you're going to have a hurricane, it's a matter of when, right? It's not a matter of if. Hurricanes are coming, and I'm not prophesying that by any means because we are praying right now that they stay away. But reality is if you stay here long enough, if you live here long enough, it's not a matter of if a storm's coming. It's just a matter of when the storm's coming. And I say that because as followers of Jesus, there has been a, a, a myth that has been bought into that somehow that when you follow Jesus, that no longer do you have storms in your life. But anybody in here that has followed Jesus long enough knows that if you follow Jesus, you probably are inviting more storms into your life. So storms are absolutely inevitable. The Bible says that it rains on the just and on the unjust, that it rains on those who love God and it rains on those who do not love God. Following Jesus does not mean that you will not have bad days. Following Jesus does not mean that bad things won't come your way. Following Jesus doesn't mean that you won't face anything. If you've actually read any of the book of Acts and you follow Paul's journey, it seems like Paul is always in a storm. And I'm not just talking about a storm with rain. I'm talking about like trials and pressures. And if you go and you just read the the biography of Paul, it seems like everywhere he's going, it's a struggle. Everywhere he's going, he's either getting beaten or he's getting imprisoned or he's getting in a, in a, in a shipwreck, which we're about to have, or he's going to get bit by a viper in just a minute. I mean, it's like, come on, I mean, no, you're like, I want to follow Jesus. I'm welcoming all this into my life. And I don't know y'all, but I, I think this is very fitting for literally the last two and a half years of our nation. We've had COVID, and then we've had political turmoil, then we've had racial tensions, and then we've had hurricanes on top of all that. Then we've had job losses, and then watch the gas prices. (laughs) And then on top of all of that, we've had deaths, and we've had mass shootings, 
and we've had rampant fear, and we've had global wars. Come on, how many of y'all know it's been, some, it's been a stormy time? It has been a stormy time. I know just for our family, just within the last two to three months of our family, it's been chaos. It's been craziness. A couple of months ago, my sons got in, a, in, a, in an accident on I-10, which was, God, thank God, God spared their life, but it could have been so much worse, totaled their car. And then right after that, my oldest son had a, had a health thing and had to be in the hospital. Then right after that, we had uh, one of our, uh, our other sons uh, threw his knee out of socket. And then, 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 then right after that, all of our family was here. And then out of the 21 people, I told you all the last time I preached, I had 21 people at my house pray for us. Yeah. Ten of them got COVID. Oh. Yeah, get you some of that. It was just like one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. This weekend, we went on a family trip. I was like, I'm going to take all my boys to the water park. So we went to Houston, and we were going to a water park. And as soon as we pulled up into the water park, Joel goes, my head hurts. And within five minutes, starts throwing up everywhere. Not because he was sick, but because he gets these medicine-induced headaches. And so him and Lindsay sat in the car for four hours. It's been storm after storm after storm, problem after problem after problem, and just when you're like, okay, this is the moment. I mean, no, just when you're like, this is the reprieve, then another one comes. And how I many you know when storms come, they usually don't come as one. They come like as seven. It's like you get it from this end and this area, and that's what was happening here. This typhoon strength was coming from the north, but also coming from the east. And what I've found oftentimes is one of the main reasons people quit their faith in God is because of storms. They just get so sick and tired of what they're going through that there's just so much I can't handle it. And they go, if, that, if, 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 if there's a God and I'm dealing with all this, then, then I don't want to have anything to do with them. And they, many times people leave the faith because of problems and storms in their life. But the opposite is actually just as much true. I've seen more people come to Jesus because of a storm. Because how many know if life's good, you don't need Jesus. But when your ship is falling apart, how many of you start realizing he's the only lifesaver? So storms are inevitable. God doesn't promise you a storm-free life, but he does promise you a storm-proof one. And, and oftentimes, watch this, the biggest storms that you and I face, if we're very honest are not external storms. The biggest storms that you and I face are usually internal storms. It's the storms that nobody sees. It's the storms of depression. It's the storms of inferiority. It's the storms of inadequacy. It's the storms of fear. It's the storms of panic attacks. It's the storms of, how, how many know, I can kind of deal with the out ones. It's the inside ones that really take me out. It's the ones that I struggle with constantly and people can look great on the outside and you don't think that anything's wrong but there is a storm brewing on the inside inside of them storms on the inside are what causes people to get divorced storms on the inside are what causes people to quit storms on the inside are what causes people to take their life yes there's storms on the outside don't get me wrong there's a lot that's inevitable but there's storms on the inside as well. And so what does God have to say about not only the external storms that we're facing, but also the internal storms that we are going through because storms are inevitable. Number two, write this down, is that storms are revealers. Storms are revealers. Acts chapter 27, he goes on. Look at the next verse. He says in verse 18, he says this, and the next day as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began, watch this, they begin to throw what? All the cargo overboard. Start getting all the cargo that was on the boat, they start throwing it overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and they threw that overboard. And now verse 20 says this, the terrible storm raged for many days. Okay, anybody been on a cruise? You've been on a cruise, shoot your hand up. If you've been on a cruise online, shoot your hand up. How many you been on a cruise? Raise your hand. Y'all, y'all like embarrassed? Like, I've been on a cruise? <laughs> okay. How many you been on a, on a boat? Like, you've been, sh- you've been fishing out on a boat on the water? Like, okay, all right, good. All right. Have any of y'all been on any of that in a storm? Okay, I don't know about y'all. I, like, I, a number of years, Pastor Bubba and me and his sons went, went uh, offshore fishing uh, out of Venice. And I was so pumped because we we're going to go offshore. We're going to go catch all this cool stuff. Okay, we got about maybe 45 minutes out 
to where we were about to do it, and uh, I had a storm brewing, not on the outside, come on, on the inside. <laughs> come on, I mean, you know, when you got that storm brewing on the inside, you're like, this is trouble, this is trouble. Let's just say I chum the waters for them. I chum the waters for them. I was so sick. I was so sick. I was just, I was letting everything in me just come out and praise the Lord. And so it was terrible. It was terrible. And I was thinking, like, this isn't even in a storm. Like, this is just normal. This was a terrible storm that raged for many days. Like, I don't know about y'all. 30 minutes of this, I'd be like, let's go home. Like, let's go back. I'm good. Let's, let's, let's go back. It got so bad that it blotted out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. This storm was so bad. Not only did it happen incessantly for so many days, it just wouldn't stop. Imagine, just imagine if you can just imagine what they're experiencing in this moment. It is dark. The sun won't even come out because the storm is so bad. They can't see the stars. There's nothing. It's pitch black. It's raining. It's windy. The waves are beating on this boat. It's getting rocked back and forth. They are probably physically exhausted from all of this. They're probably definitely emotionally exhausted from this. And to the point that this has been going on so long that they have lost all hope. They're just done. I don't have anything to do with this anymore. But you know what? You find out what someone is like when you watch them go through a storm. Do you want to know what you're like? You can find out how someone's like real quick. Just listen to them and watch them as they go through the storm because whatever is in them will come out of them. And so we can all be confident when all the waters are calm. But how I many you know it's a whole nother level of faith when it's rocking like crazy and there's darkness and there's nothing to be seen all around you. And I talk to people all the time who have just, Pastor Josh, I've just, I, I don't have any more hope. I, I, they've just given up hope. Man, there's no way this marriage is going to work. There's no way this thing's going to work. There's no way we're going to get out of debt. There's no way they're going to come back. There's no way this is going to get fixed. There's no way that, just because there's just so much that's going on. Just get to the place of, like, I just can't take it anymore. I can't take it. These guys had gotten to this point that it was so bad that they start throwing cargo over. Now, realize, this isn't a cruise ship. This is a cargo ship. So when they're throwing their cargo over, do you know what they're throwing over? Money. They're literally throwing money over because their whole job is to get from Egypt to Rome and then unload all this cargo and then get paid. And they're to the point now they've lost so much hope that money doesn't even fix it. Maybe you've been there before where you've spent all your money to try to fix everything and nothing's happening. They're throwing cargo overboard. They're throwing the furniture overboard. They're throwing everything overboard. And it also says that they could not see the sun or the stars. Now, that might not be a big deal to you, but it's not a big deal to you because if you're traveling from one place to another, you don't look to the sun or the stars to figure out where you're going. They did. Come on, we got GPS. We got... Siri, take me to Starbucks, take me to wherever. We can tell that what to do, and then we have something that maps exactly where we go. Their whole ability to even know where they're going was based off of the sun and the stars. Now watch this. God was in this moment stripping away from them everything that they had relied on. They relied on their money, not anymore. They relied on the sun and stars to give them at least some kind of direction. Not anymore. And sometimes, watch this, what storms will do is God, I don't believe God sends storms most of the times. Sometimes he does. We see this through scripture, he does. But oftentimes, God will use storms in our lives to reveal to us what we have put our hope in that is false. We maybe have put our hope in money, and then you start realizing what happens if you lose it. 
We may have put our hope in a, in a relationship, but what happens if you lose it? We may have put our hope in a, a situation or in something. We put our hope in an economy, but what happens if you crash? You put your hope in a, in a government figure. What happens if they lie? If you put your hope in, if we put our hope in all these different things, and what happens is, is oftentimes in God's love, he will remove these things from our life for you to realize you cannot put your hope in anything that won't sustain it. As a, as a family who has a son that's battling with a health disease, we can very easily put our hope in medicine. But what happens when medicine doesn't work? What happens when what you put your hope in doesn't work anymore? And in this moment, these storms are revealing things. They're revealing where these guys are putting their hope. They're revealing what is valuable. And, and I, I don't know about y'all, but I've seen this happen way too many times, is that when storms come, it, it reveals to you what matters. What matters? Go to a funeral and try to talk to them about the economy. They could care less. You know why? Because all they care about is the relationship right here in this moment. On Tuesday, I'll go do a funeral of a 15-year-old boy. Talked to his mom yesterday. We didn't talk about sports. We didn't talk about money. We didn't talk about how many cars they have. We didn't talk about their job. All we talked about is how much she wished she had her 15-year-old son. Because what storms do is they will reveal to you what matters. What matters? God matters. People matter. Eternity matters. Everything outside of that, you can get back again. So storms have this way of Understanding that they are inevitable, storms have a way of being revealers. Let me give you number three here, and that is that some storms are avoidable. Some storms are avoidable. Look at verse 21. It says, no one had eaten for a long time. You know what that's called? Hangry. <laughs> Come on, somebody. It's dark. It's wet. And I haven't eaten that's ingredients for some trouble. So finally, Paul calls the crew together and he says, men, you should have listened to me. Said no woman to her husband ever. All right. <laughs> you should have listened. Now, you're like, what are you talking about? If you go and you read the verses before, before they go and set sail, Paul tells all of them, we don't need to go on this trip. We don't need to go on this trip. I perceive that there's going to be loss and the ship is going to go down. He told that to them. And the captain said, uh, the last time I checked, you're not the captain. And he went anyways. Because how many know sometimes you want what you want no matter what anybody says and you get what you get and you hate what you got? Yep. Yes. Yes. I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> so that was a good one. Okay. So you should have, you should have listened to me. You should have listened to me, guys in the first place and not left Crete, and you would have, what's this? Avoid. You would have avoided all of this damage and all of this loss. Some storms are avoidable. Why were they in the storm? They were in the storm because it was their fault. It was their fault. Paul had told them earlier, don't go. It's not going to be good. We're going to lose the ship. Paul had warned them earlier not to go. And have you ever noticed this? Okay, if you've been in church long enough, you've probably noticed this. I've been in church almost my entire life. But the Christian circles and Christian people can often blame the devil for more things than he gets credit for. It's the devil's fault. Mm, no, you were stupid. It was the devil's fault. It was the devil's fault. And way too many people blame the devil on things that is not the devil's fault. Maybe, just maybe, you spent too much money. Maybe you bought something you shouldn't have bought, but you wanted to buy it anyways because you wanted it, and now you're in debt, and now you can't pay your bills, and now you're working overtime, and now your family doesn't see you, but at all because you bought something you shouldn't have bought. Oh, we're preaching here. Okay. Yes. I ain't getting no oh, amens on this one. I know. It's all right. Pick your toes up, okay? Maybe, just maybe, you didn't listen to wise counsel. Maybe your daddy said don't date him. Your mama said don't date him. Your best friend said don't date him. Even the devil said don't date him, but you dated him anyways. <laughs> Come on, somebody. 
and then your heart is broken, and then you're mad at everybody, and you're like, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do it. You wanted what you wanted, you didn't care about anybody else. God told you, people told you, it did not matter at all. Well, we're just getting a divorce. Well, maybe if you wouldn't have been private messaging those girls, that probably wouldn't have caused some things. Are y'all with me? I got fired. Well, maybe if you'd show up on time and work and then, are y'all with me? Okay, like, it's the devil. It's not always the devil. Okay, I, I know, listen, the devil does cause some things, but listen, okay, if you have high cholesterol, maybe Boudin King and Popeyes just ain't doing it. Just, okay, I, that's it, I'm done, okay, I'm done, I'm done. Okay, one more, no, I'm just kidding. Like, some storms are avoidable. Like, there's a storm over here, and you go, okay. And then you're in the storm, you're like, God, help me, God, why? God's like, you stupid. <laughs> like the Bible says, literally the Bible says, he who does not receive correction is stupid. It literally says that in scripture. Go look it up. Proverbs 12 tells us this. And I don't know about y'all, but it's, it's easier for me to believe that God can get me out of a storm that he got me into. But it's really hard for me to believe that God can get me out of a storm that I got myself into. But here's the good news. Here's the good news for all of us in here. Because listen, I don't know. Maybe some of y'all in here, you always obey God. You always listen to wise counsel. You're the kid that always did what was right. And everybody didn't like you because you were the goody person. And everybody, that may be you. But for all of those in here that got a little rebellion in them that want to do things your own way, that got to figure it out the hard way. For those of you in here that are like me in some regards, thinking that rules don't apply to them at times, all right, that my wife doesn't say, but she does say, okay, she tells me. <laughs> Yet in the middle of all that, I am grateful. I am grateful that even when God would speak to you on the land and you still avoid what he said for you to do, when you're middle in the storm, he will speak to you again to get you out of something that you got yourself into. This is the gospel that we preach, is that what you got yourself into, God can get you out of. This is the good news, because in this moment, Paul was like, see you suckers, I'm out. He said, you should have listened to me. We would have avoided all of this. We would have avoided all of this. And that's the gospel. The gospel is that what you get yourself into, God can get you out of. Now, with that being said, some of you are in a storm and it wasn't your fault. Because there was 250 plus passengers on here and it was only the captain that made the decision for everybody else. So some of them were on the ship and they're in the storm, not because it was their decision, but because of the person that they were following made a stupid decision, and now they are dealing with his stupid. Y'all with me? It, it, so there's some of us in here that have been affected and have had storms in our life, not necessarily because you made the bad decision, but because you maybe married the bad decision. Maybe your parents got the divorce and you got the ramifications of the divorce. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. Maybe there's been some things that have happened to you because of other people's decisions and other people's sinfulness. It wasn't necessarily yours. Maybe you got fired from the job because the boss wasn't wise with the finances and so they lost the company and now you lost the job, but it wasn't your fault. It was their fault. But yet again, you're still in the middle of the storm even if it wasn't your fault. Are y'all with me? So some storms are avoidable. Some storms aren't. Some storms are inevitable. Some storms are revealers. Regardless of what it is, we're all facing storms in some way or another. And in this moment, I love this because uh, as the passengers are sinking in fear, Paul is rising in faith. What is it about Paul that gave him the ability to stand confidently, even in the midst of a, of a thing like this that says, hey, we could have avoided all this, guys, but we're in it. 
And, and this is what Paul's gonna do. And let me just help you understand what Paul's gonna do. Paul is about to do this. He's like, hey guys, we got two options here. Option one we can keep talking about the bad decision and the bad, bad uh, choices that you make and we can keep reliving in the past or we can redesign the future. You got two options, relive the past or redesign the future. But I'm gonna here today to tell you that shoulda, coulda, woulda ain't gonna fix nothing. How many of y'all got some things in your past you wish you could go back and fix? Anybody in here? But I'm going to just tell you right now, there's probably a lot of things you cannot fix. There may be some things that you can own. There's some things that you can repent of. There's some things you can get forgiveness from. But at some point, you've got to make a decision. I'm not going to keep living in my past because if I keep living in my past, this sink is shipping. Uh, sink is shipping. Ship is sinking. The sink is shipping. <laughs> this ship is sinking. And some of you, you're drowning right now because God's given you an option to go to go, but you want to keep staying in the past. You can't stay in the past. So Paul says, I've got an option for us to move forward. Yeah, maybe there's some stuff in your past you don't like. There may be some decisions you made that you shouldn't have made. But hey, listen, God gives you a second chance. And God says, okay, here's what we're going to do. And watch. So Paul says this. In the midst of all this, he says, well, you should have listened, but take courage. Everybody say, take courage. Take courage. Come on, say it again. Take courage. take courage. None of you will lose your lives. Well, that's good. Even though the ship's going down. For the last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted you safety to everyone sailing with you. How many of y'all grateful, know that they're grateful Paul's on the ship? So take courage, for I believe God, it will be just as he said. So if you fast forward this, a couple more verses, it says that they begin to lay, let down anchors to try to stop themselves from having the ship destroyed. Um, but it doesn't work. The ship gets destroyed, the ship runs aground, the ship doesn't make it. And yet in that, I want you to see that there were anchors that they tried to do to, uh, to get through the storm. But the anchors that Paul had were not physical anchors that they let down with the ship. They were anchors of his soul. I want everybody to listen to me. You're going to go through more storms. Some of you are in one. Some of you just came out of one. And some of you are about to go into one. And if I'm your pastor, I... I there's nothing I can do to probably prevent most of them. Some of them are avoidable. But what I can help you with and what the Bible helps us with is that there are anchors that you can have when you go through it. Anchors in your own soul. How many of you have watched someone, maybe a close family or a friend, that has gone through a storm and it has destroyed their life? They're not the same anymore. So today I want us to, I want us to be anchored I want us to be anchored to something that can help us walk through whatever we are walking through. So I'm going to give you three anchors as we wrap up our time together. I'm going to give you three anchors that you've got to have in your life if you're going to get through a storm. If you want to survive it, hey, the ship may go down. And, and, and can I just say that? There may be some ships in your life that need to go down. Some of you have some relationships that need to go. Some of you have some friendships that need to go. There are some things that God probably wants us to take out because we've got some false hope in the ship. Notice that Paul was never confident in his means of transportation. He was just confident that he was gonna get there. And sometimes we can be too confident in the transportation than we are in the actual purpose of where God wants us to go. God was going, no, 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 I'm not gonna give you confidence in the transportation. I'm gonna give you confidence in the revelation that I'm gonna get you there. Amen. Can how many know God can get you there? He can figure it out. And so here we are. We're going to have three anchors, three anchors that we've got to have. Number one is the anchor of presence, the anchor of presence. And I want us to go back and I want us to look at Paul and what he said to uh, all of these people that were on the ship. Go back to verse 23. He says this, for last night, an angel of, the, of, of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, whom I belong and whom I serve. Everybody say that with me. Whom I belong and whom I, one more time, whom I belong and whom I serve. Watch this. What did he do? 
He stood beside me. Everybody listen to this very closely. Never allow the presence of a storm to cause you to doubt the presence of God. Never allow the presence of a storm to ever, 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 ever cause you to doubt the presence of God. In whatever you're going through right now, you just need to have this anchored inside of you that God has not left you. God will never leave you. God is always with you. God is always standing by you. He is with you. He is for you. He is in you. And sometimes, sometimes, God does rescue us from storms. But oftentimes, God is with us in storms. Sometimes he pulls us out of it. But often more than not, God often steps into the middle of it. How many know the Bible says, I shall not fear that God is with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God, you are with me. We know that the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God didn't take them from the fire. He got in it with them. We know that the the disciples went through a boat and had a storm too. Guess what? Guess who was on the ship? Jesus. He didn't, he, he, and, and yes, he calmed the storm, but he still let them go through it. And he was still in it. And I want you to know that in this moment, an angel of the Lord appears to him, stands beside him. Paul says, I'm not alone. I'm not alone in this. Yes, it's dark, and yes, it's emotional, and yes, I'm exhausted, and yes, I need some food, and yes, I need this, and yes, these people are getting crazy, and yes, I don't know which way we're going to go. But God met him right there in that moment and stood beside him. And you just need to have the anchor of the presence of God. Notice what Paul's going to say. Actually, if you go and you look in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy shares with us. This is Paul again, another book, but Paul is writing, and he is referring back to the times in his life where he walked through storms. And in 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 17, it said this. Watch this. He says this. Everyone abandoned me. Maybe some of you feel that way. Man, I just, I have no one. I'm by myself. Paul goes, I feel you. I feel you, but may it not be counted against them. So even though maybe they've left me, I'm not holding that against them. I'm not holding that against them. The Lord stood with me, and he gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he, what did he do? He rescued me from certain Death, this is what he did. How many of you look back at storms in your life that you thought were going to take you out, but now that you are on another side of that storm, you look back and you realize God was using that storm to strengthen you, to develop you, to build you, to help you? Come on, how many know? In the middle of it, you want it out of it, but now that you're on the other side, you thank God for it because you are better because of it. Yeah, there's some hard things you had to walk through, and do you want to go through it again? No. But yet in the middle of it, what I did not realize is that God was strengthening me because watch this, muscles only get strengthened under resistance. Can I say that again? Muscles only get strengthened under resistance. You do not get strength without resistance. But we are a a people in a nation that chooses comfort over everything. And as soon as it gets uncomfortable, we quit. And as soon as it gets uncomfortable, we stop. As soon as it gets uncomfortable, I'm done. Don't quit. God is strengthening you. God is for you. God is with you. God is in it. Peace is not the absence of a storm. Peace is found in the presence of Jesus in the storm. He's with me. He's with me. And no matter what you're going through, whether it's a health battle or a physical battle or a relational battle or a financial battle or a job battle or whatever it is, just know God is with you. He's with you. So we have the anchor of presence that I haven't been neglected. I am a son. You are a son or a daughter of the king. A father does not neglect their children. He's with them. As soon as any of our sons go, Dad, I'm running to the room. I'm running to the room. And I'm telling you, every time you pray out and say, God, Father, he runs to you. The Bible says he is near the brokenhearted. Anybody receive that today? He's with you. It's the anchor of presence. Let me give you the second thing. 
the anchor of purpose. Verse 24 says, and he said, do not be afraid, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. This is, what, this is what God's saying. Listen, the ship may go down, but I've still got stuff for you. If you're not dead yet, you're not done yet. God has more people to reach, Paul. God's more people to win. Got more churches to plant. The ship may go down, but the storm won't take you out because my hand is upon you. I am for you. I am with you. And everything that you look like that you think that you need to get where you're going to go, you don't actually need it as long as you depend on me. I will make sure that your purposes gets fulfilled because it's my my purposes that I put in you. And so Paul gets a revelation that I don't need this ship to get where God wants me to go. If God's got to get a mule to me, he'll get a mule to me. If God wants me to fly on an eagle, he'll get me on it. Like God has a way of getting me to his purpose and there's nothing that is ever going to detract from that even though it looks like everything that I need to do God's purpose is falling in front of me. He goes, no, no, Paul, hey, keep your courage up, bro. You're going to Rome, you're going to preach. I've got something for you. Yeah, the ship's gonna go down, but you're not gonna go down. I have things for you in this, in this moment. And in fact, what will often happen is God will allow the storms that you walk through to teach you how you can also help other people go through their storms. How many of you have been through some storms in your life and you look at, at other people going through something that you went through and it gives you the ability to go, I've been there. Keep going, keep going. One day you're gonna be able to say, I've been through a storm just like that. We survive unfaithfulness in our marriage. We overcame financial hardship. I used to be in bondage, but by the grace of Jesus, I have been set free, and the same Christ who set me free can set you free. If God has, if you're not done, God, God's still working, God's still using. So just know that every person in here has purpose. Just as Paul had a purpose, God has given you and I purpose. This is what we want to help you begin to discover and uncover and walk into. And even when it looks like it's all said and done and I'm out, this is it, I'm done. I mean, Paul's got to think this has got to be it. The presence of God shows up and just reminds him, you're not done yet. You're not done yet. Which leads to the last one, and that is the anchor of faith. The anchor of faith. So we've got the anchor of presence, God's with us. We've got the anchor of purpose, God wants to use us. But we also have the anchor of faith. He says this at the very end. He says, so take courage. Notice how many times he has said this. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Why does, why does God always tell us that? Why does God tell you not to be afraid? You ready? Because we get afraid. Like, why does God always say take courage? Like in Joshua chapter one, before they're gonna go into the promised land, God tells Joshua, hey, be strong and of good courage. But why does he say that? And by the way, he doesn't say it once, he says it three times. Why does he keep repeating himself? Because he knew that what Joshua and the children of Israel were about to go up against was gonna require strength and courage. Strength and courage. Are y'all, y'all ready? If you're gonna live for Jesus, and be fully devoted to him. In this day and age, it's gonna take strength and courage. I don't know about y'all, following Jesus ain't really the popular thing anymore. Living your life according to the word of God ain't popular anymore. It ain't. It's gonna take strength and it's gonna take courage. It's gonna take strength and it's gonna take courage. Not just from the storms on the outside, but even from the storms on the inside. I think probably in the last year I've faced more storms on the inside than I've faced on the outside. And I feel like I've faced a good bit on the outside. But I'm not scared of the storms on the outside taking me out. I'm more scared of the storms on the inside taking me out. The storms on the inside are, are, is what gets you to quit. The storms on the inside are the ones that get you to, to doubt. Is God who he really says he is? Storms on the inside are the ones that we often struggle in this. And so the Apostle Paul says this, so take courage. And notice he doesn't say, man, I believe in myself. I got this. I can do this. 
He says, no, you know, my faith is not in myself. My faith is not in my strengths. My faith is not in my gift. No, no, I believe God. It will be just as he said. My faith is is not in what I see. My faith is in what God says. You can't control when a storm blows up. You can't control how severe the storm is. You can't control how long the storm lasts. You can't control what people say. You can't control what people do. But you can control what you believe. You can control your attitude. You can control where you put your faith. You can control what you're going to do. And my faith is in the ones who created the winds and the waves and the ones who can calm them down. Paul did not have confidence in the ship. He had confidence in the Savior. Y'all with me? Too much we put our confidence in one ship. But God says, no, 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 don't put your confidence in the ship. That can go down. But put your confidence in me. Which reminds me of what David says in Psalms 46. As we end today, Psalms 46, verse 1 through 3. David, the psalmist, says this. God is our what? He's our refuge. He's also our what? He's always what? He's always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come. We will not fear when hurricanes come. We will not fear when the political stuff doesn't happen the way we want it to. We will not fear when the news says something that's totally different. We will not fear when our kids go to school. We will not fear when our marriage isn't on the rocks. We will not fear when, when the finances are tough. We will not fear because my refuge is in God. My strength is in God. He's ready to help me in every time. In the mountains, in the crumble into the sea, let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the water surge. I will not fear. Why? Because he's with me. Because he's never left me. Because he won't forsake me. Because he's all that I need. Because he is my safety. He is my strength. He is my comforter. He is my source. He is my redeemer. He is my righteousness. He is all that I need. And it's okay to grieve the losses. Do you have permission to grieve the loss? I thought that relationship was always gonna be with me. Yeah, I know. I thought this was how it's gonna go. Yeah, I know. But I've gotta trust that God sees what I can't see. That God is with me. And if it doesn't look good yet, God's not done yet, God's still working. He's here, he's here, he's here. So I don't know who in this room this is a word for. But if this is a word for you, would you just shoot your hands up all across this room? And I I just wanna know who I'm praying for this morning. Would you just stand all across this room? Would you just stand, just stand. Right there where you are, just stand up. This is a word for you. The anchor of presence, anchor of purpose, the anchor of faith, Our faith is not in our giftings. Our faith is not in our strength. Our faith is not in our wisdom. God is our refuge. God is our strength. Would you just do this? Would you just lift your hands all across this room that are in here? Those that are watching online, maybe you're watching. I don't know where you're watching from, whether you're watching from your house, your car, hospital bed, whatever it may be. I believe the presence of God can meet us wherever we are. He's looking just for people that have a posture of God. I need you. So for those that are in here, you're standing. If you're you're sitting, would you just stretch your hands towards those that are right there, maybe that are beside you, that are standing, because they're walking through something maybe you don't know, but yet God knows, and so we put our faith along with them. And so, Father, I just pray right now, Lord, for all those that are standing in this room right now, and all those who are watching online, God, that represent someone who's just going through a storm in their life. God, you know what it is. Maybe it's something externally, maybe it's circumstantial, maybe it's relationship, but God, maybe it's also something emotional. 
Maybe it's something in their own mind. Maybe it's something in their own heart. Whatever it may be, God, I know the truth, and that is that you're a good God, that you are with them. I pray that there would be a level of confidence that rises in this house for every person that's here that knows you are with them. And would you just declare this right there where you are for those that are here, would you just say this, God, thank you for being with me in this moment. You have never left me. You have not forsaken me. You are with me. You are strengthening me. You are helping me. You are encouraging me. My faith is in what? you say. So today, I declare that over my feelings. Father, I thank you, Lord, for every person that's here. And we do make that declaration right now, that even when we don't feel it, even when we, there's times we don't sense it, we know these truths to be true. You are for us, you are with us, that you are the rock, you are our refuge. We don't run from you, we run to you. And so right now, God, we are running to you. We need you. We need you. So Holy Spirit, do what you do. Strengthen your people. Encourage your people. Still faith into them. God, I pray, Lord, that you would walk with them. May they feel your presence, not only just in this room, but I pray even as they leave this room, as they go back maybe into hard situations at home or in relationships or in their jobs, or, Lord, maybe back to even a doctor. Lord, I, I pray that you would just encourage them, strengthen them, and walk with them. God, may we, may we be as Paul did, and in a moment when the, sink, uh, the ship is sinking, God, that our faith is rising. I pray that in this house. God, may faith arise. May faith arise. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. God, we lift our eyes off of ourselves and we look to the hills where our help comes from. And so, God, we don't, uh, we don't thank you before the miracle. We thank you uh, right now while the miracle is still even being created. We give you praise for who you are and we worship you for who you are. We surrender our lives to you, God. Come and have your way in us. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Come on, can we give?